Senate House conferees working on the tax bill said they were going to keep meeting until they got it done. They have now saved the three martini lunch business deduction, but they've gone back to the far stricter requirements on the reporting of income from tips. And so far, they've made major changes in medical deductions. It means it will be much harder to claim a medical write-off. Other details are being worked out, and the House and Senate should begin considering the compromise bill next week. As a rule, the House and Senate go along with a conference committee compromise, but they do not have to, and there is organized opposition in the House. President Reagan has said he has to have the tax bill passed to help the national economy. He said it often enough that the bill is now identified with Mr. Reagan. So whatever the bill's economic urgency, it is a political must for the president. He has to sell it, which, as correspondent Andrea Mitchell reports, may not be all that easy. If you're trying to sell a tax increase in an election year, do commercials paid for by the Republican National Committee. But don't mention the word tax. And now a very important building block of that program needs to be put in place. That legislation is before the Congress now, and you can help our economic recovery by urging your congressman or woman to support that bill. Then send out the cabinet to call on congressmen like Illinois Republican Tom Corcoran. Don't forget to invite the networks to record this photo opportunity. Meanwhile, call in more congressmen for a little friendly persuasion at the White House. Not pressure tactics, said a White House spokesman. Education. And even though it's getaway day for a Camp David weekend, come into the briefing room yourself to explain why you've changed your mind about raising taxes during a recession. There isn't any flip-flop on this at all. Um, I would prefer to reduce our budget deficits by continuing to reduce government spending. And I still think that there is more to be done in that regard. But the simple fact is that we could not get the spending cuts we were asking for unless we would agree to some increases in revenue. Was the White House threatening congressmen with political reprisals? No, we're, we're not threatening anybody and I'm going to do everything I can to get all the Republicans I can uh, into office. But leaders of the new right who ate eggs and talked strategy on Thursday claim the White House is playing hardball. They're using the same phone banks to try to defeat the president on the tax issue that they used two years ago to elect him. Where'd you get that shirt? Clearly wearing a new shirt, the president left for Camp David. He didn't look worried, but his aides are. So worried about the conservative rebellion that they are bringing congressmen to Camp David this weekend for the full treatment. Mr. Reagan will work on them, and on a televised speech he'll give Monday night. In one of this year's best political ironies, the conservative Republicans, not the Democrats, have already asked the networks for time to respond. Andrea Mitchell, NBC News at the White House. Legitimate news conferences are not subject to requests for the other side from the other side to get time to reply. I suppose the theory is that reporters will ask questions every bit as nasty as the political opposition. Mr. Reagan had an informal news conference Friday, said a kind word for the tax bill, then had a couple of questions that, if not nasty, were at least pointed. To begin with, this tax bill is not, as it has so often been mislabeled, the biggest tax increase in history. That's plain hogwash. The goal is simple and just, to see to it that everyone pays his fair share, no more, no less. Mr. President, when you passed that big tax cut last year and signed the legislation, you thought that was going to cure the economy and get the job done. <laughs> Why didn't it work? Why do we need a tax increase now? It is working. Granted, you don't suddenly see a bonanza, but beginning with the first minor tax cut, that first 5% installment, there has been an increase in personal savings that has not been true over the last decade. There has also been an increase now in real earnings. The fact that interest rates have come down. The fact that uh, retail sales on an annualized basis have been rising since January at about 12%. All of these things, I think, are the evidences that we have bottomed out in the recession. And I think that we're entitled to take some credit for that. Why didn't you take the kind of highly publicized public action to stop the bombing uh, in Beirut before you did yesterday? Perhaps hundreds of thousands, could, or thousands anyway, could have been saved. Why not, be, why not go public no matter what you may have said in private, sir? Well, 
Much of what we said, and we weren't silent or idle in all this time that Habib has been working, but the sensitivity of the negotiations were such that I avoided, as you know, anything that might uh, interfere with those negotiations or uh, in some way uh, injure what Ambassador Habib was trying to accomplish. Why don't you tell us a little bit of how you felt in these nine weeks with people being bombarded and you're continuing to send weapons to inflict this horror on them? I think that perhaps the, uh, the image has been rather one-sided uh, because of the uh, Israeli capability at replying. But um, in many instances, the, in fact, most of them, the ceasefire was broken by PLO attacking those Israeli forces. Uh, well, they were the invaders, were they not? Are they the invaders or is the PLO the invaders? Lebanon and is the country. Also on Friday, Mr. Reagan signed a proclamation making August 26th Women's Equality Day. On that date in 1920, women won the right to vote. The peculiarity is that in popularity polls, Mr. Reagan always does better with men than he does with women, part of which might have been caused by his opposition to the Equal Rights Amendment. Now more news of Friday on A Reel. Beirut was not bombed Friday. There was sporadic sniping in the city, but the ceasefire demanded by President Reagan held, and that allowed the peace talks to resume. The hospitals were full. Hundreds of people wounded in the bombings Thursday were treated, a lot of them suffering from phosphorus burns. It was the 11th ceasefire. At least two people died as heavy rains flooded Kansas City and other Missouri towns to the south. The rain fell at a rate of two to three inches an hour. Motors were stranded in water six to ten feet deep in some places, and at least two houses washed from their foundations. There were some power failures. Parts of roads were washed away, and more than 40 families were driven from their homes. Panic at the Hong Kong stock market all week. Communist China hinted it might take over control of the British Crown Colony when the lease expires in 15 years. Then the government sold a prime building site, now a parking lot, to Communist Chinese interests at bargain prices, and the Hong Kong Stock Index dropped 100 points. Titan missiles won't be phased out of the defense system until October, but this one near Tucson is coming out now for maintenance. The odds are it won't ever go back into its 20-year-old silo. The missile wing commander says what happens next is up to Congress. We've been uh, directed to begin phase down beginning the 1st of October. I think it's highly unlikely that we'll get this missile back up unless we get new direction from the Congress. What Amy Carter is doing on her vacation is spending a quiet two weeks with a family in the north of England, a nice family in a Northumberland village who named their daughter after her. It's part of an exchange program started by Amy's dad, and nobody's really bothered by the six nice Secret Service agents, at least not Amy. The Secret Service men don't bother me much. I have them at home also. And they're, most of them are pretty good friends. And this will be over quick. <laughs> Tonight's Not Ready for Prime Time news is about garbage and people who are hungry enough to dig through garbage to find their food. There is a group in Washington that wants supermarkets to let the hungry go through the store's garbage to salvage what they can. A supermarket chain says it would rather donate fresh food, but while there may be food in the garbage bin, there is also broken glass and vermin and other things. That is true. So is this. People live out of garbage cans, not only in desperately poor or war-torn countries, but here in the United States, even in a relatively wealthy city. Wayne Friedman of KRON in San Francisco reports. I just don't care. Take a drink, sir. Mid-afternoon, south of Market Street, Norman E. Bouchard and Robert E. Brennan toast their evening meal. 
Now ask me why I do that. I don't want to put a dead brothers. Does it bother you? It must bother you having to eat out of trash bins. Uh, I'd be a damn fool if I go hungry, man. Depending on who we ask, there are between one and eight thousand people without places to sleep in San Francisco. They're out of the mainstream, but not out of sight. Life is absurd, man. Street life has its own laws, its own customs. People share. If a man can't find dignity in himself, he finds it in a group. That's the way it works, man. You think? You guys are share. Goes around, come around. Hey, you got to shut up, you get out of here! Yeah, you call the police, call me! Okay, I'll well, kill you, shucks! You son of a bitch. He's a fair assumption, thousand to my soul. Night approaches south of Market Street. Time to be getting home. And we can look into these verses, though, and see that God did not forget about us. God has not forgotten. Most of society has. That's harsh reality for a room full of street people taking their sermon before supper. Now, I don't have any magic spell to give you that's going to straighten out your life. All I have is honesty. God says, I'll accept you as you are. The Lifeline Mission, 71 years old, one of only a few places where San Francisco street people may find a free, clean bed for the night. <laughs> the faces reflect a cross-section of people living on San Francisco streets. They include many newcomers. Mike is a tuna fisherman, out of work for three weeks. Does it scare you being out here? Well, sure. Uh, you'd rather get me now, right? The mission only has 21 bunks. Not enough room for the estimated one to eight thousand people living on San Francisco streets. Not enough room for Mike, who doesn't know where he'll go. Uh, no, I, all the beds were kind of full, so I'm, I don't know exactly. Um, I'll figure it out, though. Good luck. Thanks, man. As the morning grows older, commuters trickle in from the suburbs, and Market Street cleans up. Let's go get the way. Take care of the Sure, 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 sure. If you're drunk, down and out, and spend any time near Market Street, then sooner or later you'll ride in Police Van 610. Okay, 3 by 31 to headquarters. Go ahead. We'll be 10-7 uh, in the Southern District on the Roundup. Once the van is full, police will more than likely take their passengers to the Ozanam Center, better known as Detox. Let's go. 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 Let's go
All of the Major League Baseball teams played Friday, and here are the scores on a roll. Detroit walked all over the Kansas City Royals Friday night, 10 to 1. Tom Brookins almost knocked himself out on this pop fly. He caught it anyway. In the bottom of the fourth inning, the Tigers scored five runs. Brookins hit a two-run home run, his seventh of the year. Two batters later, Lou Whitaker hit a two-run home run, his second home run of the game. Glenn Williams followed with a home run, his fifth of the year. The final, Tigers 10, Royals 1.